In 2008, I was 19 and deployed to Afghanistan. I was at a small post in the southern area of the country. It was very mountainous and not very populated. We had men who weren't in uniform coming in and out several times a week, never staying for more than two days. We were all pretty positive they were special forces of some sort or maybe CIA contractors. They didn't have much interaction with any of us pretty much ever, they stayed in their own groups. There were a lot of rumors going around that they were doing some kind of psychological warfare things, like ambushing and killing all but one in the dark, butchering corpses and leaving them in front of suspected villages, burning things down, just, you know, crazy things to mess with people. Well, about my third week at this posting, we were told in the morning they wanted us to check in on a village not too far from us. They had been complaining about us killing goats and skinning them which really wasn't that uncommon. We had complained all the time to try to get money and other things from us in repayment. Then we had a report of a patrol in the area see a bunch of women and children carrying a lot of things rushing away from the area. Kind of suspicious activity. The next morning we set up before the sun was all the way up. The village was a little less than an hour drive from us. The whole area was pretty flat in a valley most of the way there, but... About two kilometers from the village, you have to take a small dirt single track road up the mountain. The entire village was on top of a small mountain, but in like a big bowl. It was just maybe a dozen small walled off houses and sheds. No more than 40 people lived there. Well, as we sped up and approached the village, our comms freaked out. All we heard was static. The four of us heard voices. They all said it was like a hundred people were all talking at once. You could hear it, but couldn't quite make out what was being said. That lasted for about a minute. The other group radioed us and said that three of the six of them had heard clinking metal and a harsh, loud scream, a wet, gurgling scream. Then mid-scream, it just cuts off and went silent. We radioed back and reported what had happened. We were told to continue on. Our radios are encrypted. There was next to no way anyone could have gotten into them. Not even five minutes later it happened again, but this time to more than half of us. We heard people talking while breathing heavily like they were running. So many voices all at once. Like had to rip my headset off and helmet off like many of the others. It was bad. We were out in the open all in a panic. We reported it again, but one guy said he heard what was kind of like Farsi or a Persian language. Another said kind of like Latin and I swear what I heard was in Russian. We were told it might just be interference with switch channels and keep on task. At this point we were maybe 30 meters from the entrance of the village. It's a pretty big open area on this mountain, not much to hide behind besides the buildings. Someone noticed a thin blood trail leading into the village. We took note and continued on. When we stepped into the village, we saw a puddle of dried brown blackish blood. Before we could even register what we saw, three military aged men stepped out and opened fire at us. We all dove for cover. I ran behind this one to one and a half meter high wall surrounding a small building. As soon as I dropped, a man stepped out of the building and shot at me. I panicked. This was my first time being shot at. I shot at him at least eight times two of which smacked him in the chest. Someone from the other side of the wall on a building was firing at me, so I ran to hide behind the building the man just came out of. I took cover next to the man, listening to his gurgling, heavy last breaths. After all was said and done, we had reinforcements arrive. We put down eight men and wounded two more. Nothing on our side. While everyone was taking the required pictures and whatnot, an army patrol came by with four of the women from the village. They said they found them hiding in a nearby town begging for help. They had to pretty much carry the women back as they refused to return. We split the women up and began to question them. They admitted the men were gathering and getting things together to attack a patrol. Someone had promised them a great reward. But they were crying, all terrified to be back. Our interpreter asked them what, what had them so shaken. Is it because of the fight? They said the morning before, as the sun was coming up, they saw what looked like a bloody man walking up. Some of the women went to try to give aid when they stopped and screamed. 
As the man walked closer, he was naked from head to toe. No hair and no skin. Each step he took looked like his knees would buckle and collapse. He had no eyes and no muscle around his jaw. His head just swung around loose like nothing rigid to hold it up as he walked. They said he was slow and jerky. They could hear him breathing. He was wet and heavy like he was drowning. The men hearing the woman scream and run grabbed some weapons, some were muskets, some tools. As he walked closer, they saw his belly was slit and things were just swimming from his gut. The men began to fire at him. The thing didn't notice, didn't even flinch and chunks of him were ripped off. We finally stopped when the men were reloading and opened his arms like he was going to hug someone and screamed, screamed so loud they had to cry. The men closest to him began to bleed from their eyes and ears and finally collapsed. The next thing they knew, he was gone, just vanished into a light red mist. The men who fell were gone too, not a trace, no footprints or anything, just the trail of blood into the village. We all kind of looked at each other like, that's nonsense, no way. We kind of ignored it and continued on with documenting and cleaning up. After several hours, we were leaving, and I was in front with six other men. We were all talking about the radio thing when one of us just stopped and yelled for us to drop. We all listened and spread out, dropping low. There we were, out in the wide open and empty, nothing to hide behind. But there in the middle of the dirt tracks was a horse with its legs cut off, flush at the joints, with its head twisted upside down. Something was sticking out of its belly and it has something carved into its skin. We thought it was an IED so we went through the standard processes and cleared the area. When we were sure all was well we finally approached it. It has a one meter long shard of a broken mirror stuck in its side. Arabic letters carved into it. The half of the horse facing away from us was skinned. So cleanly there wasn't a drop of blood or a cut into the meat. We asked our interpreter what the Arabic word said. He said it isn't Arabic, but kind of like Farsi, but not at the same time. He said he thought it said, look, look, don't look. We were all freaked out. We went back and reported everything. Our CO listened to the entire story and after a long silence that felt like half an hour said, it was nothing. Exhaustion and stress from your first engagement. Be careful who you tell. People will be begging to question your mental fitness. Later, when some of us went to shower, there was yelling. The guys who were out there with us said they saw that their faces had no skin in the mirror. We calmed them down and moved them out so we could shower. I was the first one done and went to shave when I saw a red, skinless person in the corner of the mirror. That was 11 years ago yesterday. I still sometimes see him in the mirror. In my bathroom, I don't have a mirror at all. I go to a barber once a week to shave me. The last time I shaved myself, my daughter was in watching me when I saw the man in the corner of my eye right next to her. She saw him in the mirror too and ran off screaming. What makes this all crazy is that in that deployment, three of us from the day were killed in an IED, two were critically injured in another. Our interpreter was killed with his family in his home, four killed themselves within three years of returning home. That's eight dead and two injured just like the villagers. I've only told maybe a dozen people about this, only one or two believe me. I can't find anything like this anywhere in the world. I know the area had a lot of history, like the Russians had a base where we had ours in the 80s. Some say Alexander the Great marched his army in that valley too. I don't know what to think of it, and I need to know more about it. It's been bugging me for years. I grew up not far from Mantino State Hospital an abandoned insane asylum in the far south Chicago suburbs. My dad would sometimes drive my family down there and we'd circle around the property by car, just for fun. 
When I turned 16, he bought me my own little beater car and, of course, I had to show this awesome place to my friends. By the time I was old enough to go exploring, many of the original buildings had been renovated and repurposed as businesses. Half of the property was converted into the local VA hospital and a quarter of it was torn down and replaced with new housing. Only a handful of the original buildings remained, all clustered in the back corner of the campus. One summer day I took friends A, B, and C to go check it out. We brought our cameras and went with the intent to go inside and explore it. We parked in a lot where other people parked to go to work in one of the other buildings to avoid suspicion and walked about a quarter mile to the abandoned hall. As we walked up to this creepy old building I felt sick to my stomach and full of dread. The main doors were chained shut and most of the windows were boarded up. I remember walking on the porchway and choosing my steps carefully because the windows were busted out and there was glass everywhere. The four of us finally came upon a window that was accessible enough to climb into. Realizing that this was actually going to happen, I had a panic attack and couldn't go through with it. I was trembling and didn't want to be the scaredy cat, but I really couldn't do it. In fact, just in recounting this, I'm still scared and this happened about 16 years ago already. Anyway, I handed my camera to friend A and told him to take the pictures. I was petrified and felt like I would puke at any moment. Friend B and I walked back to the car in silence. I had a cigarette in the car while we waited for friends A and C to come back. My nerves calmed quickly enough. Friend B confessed that she was scared too and was glad I said something so she didn't have to go in. Soon enough, our other two friends came running back to the car at full speed. We heard their footsteps pounding on the asphalt and quickly unlocked the doors. I started the car up and we were off in an instant. I assumed that the cops had arrived so I sped out of the campus and into town, hoping to blend into normal traffic. I asked them what had happened and if the cops were called and they said no. Both friends who had gone into the building said that they heard voices both of them said they saw a hand curl around the frame of a big metal corridor door and heard it slam shut with an impressive echo. Both of them testified that they heard someone crying, saying, Where am I? At some point, they got too frightened to continue and just decided to bolt. I was spooked. Friend A, who had taken my camera, was eerily quiet. Friend C showed me that he had found a newspaper from 1979 on the floor and he had taken it as a souvenir. I, being the more superstitious type, demanded he get rid of it. I didn't want any potentially haunted objects in my car, so he tossed it out the window without too much coercion. It took us about 45 minutes to drive home, and since we were kind of shook, we decided to go to Denny's and rehash the experience. During the ride back, friend A fell asleep. This didn't concern me much at the time, but became an important factor to remember later on. We got to Denny's and friends B and C went in ahead. I woke up friend A and asked him what happened. Why did they run? He said, We saw someone sitting at the end of a hallway, cross-legged on the floor. It was a man and he was crying, kind of rocking back and forth. He also explained that he thinks the entity used his energy to manifest and that was why he was feeling so drained and fell asleep on the way back. We had a late dinner and then I drove everyone home afterwards. After I dropped my last friend off and was going back to my house, I distinctly felt someone pressing their knees into the back of the driver's seat. It's a familiar feeling if you take the bus in high school. Lots of people prop their knees up on the seat and the feeling is unmistakable. I yelped and sat straight up so my back wasn't touching my chair and drove home faster. The very next day, I pick up my cousin to go see a movie together. She blurted out to me that she thought she saw someone in my back seat. I was immediately horrified as I hadn't confided in her the events from the night before. I asked her which seat and she said, of course, behind the driver's seat. That night, I had a dream about a man. He was Caucasian, mid-thirties, brown hair, partially bald. He had brown eyes. He was wearing a white cotton vest, which I found odd. 
instinctively knew it was the ghost my friends had seen at the hospital. In the dream, he was guiding me through a series of booby traps. He was holding me by the elbow and walking with me. He seemed sweet and harmless. I thought maybe he's a guardian or something. These dreams continued for about a week straight. Friend who didn't know about our trip to the asylum started to have experiences in my car. One friend heard and felt someone whisper in her ear. Another had their elbow grabbed by someone in the back seat. I felt the knees in my back on many occasion. In fact, I started to anticipate it and often drove without my back touching the seat at all. One time I felt like someone was shaking my seat while I was driving, like hands on either side of the chair and just violently shaking. When the experiences and the dreams didn't stop, I became scared. I didn't feel like he was a guardian anymore. Finally, after about a week and a half of this, I sat down with a friend A again. I asked him, do you remember what he looked like? He said, all I could see was that he was balding and he was wearing a white vest. I don't know how, but I think his name was David. I told my parents about what happened after that. They suggested I tell David that he couldn't follow me anymore. To tell him to go to the light or whatever. At this point, I was ready to do anything because I was on edge and spooked all the time. I prayed every time I came into the house that he wouldn't follow me in. I was afraid to go out with my friends. I was afraid to go to sleep sometimes. So, two weeks after our initial adventure into the asylum, I went back with friend A. We went during the daytime and idled in the front of the building. I said out loud, You don't belong here with me. You need to go home. Or something along those lines. I prayed a lot. I didn't want him anymore. I felt bad, but I needed him to stay there. We parked and just kind of sat there quietly for a while. I think friend A and I were just saying goodbye, severing ties, I don't know, but it felt sad. While we were parked, I did hear doors slamming inside the building. At one point, I heard someone laughing, too. I envisioned him leaving me in my car. I told him he could never follow me again. He needed to go, to move on. We left the hospital that day and didn't go back for many years, and I never dreamt of him again. I've never told anyone the full story for two reasons. One being that it sounds a little bit ridiculous, and two, because I am afraid that thinking about him too much will send some sort of psychic beacon out to attract him or other spirits back to me, when that's the total opposite of what I want. When I moved out of home, I moved into an old creepy house. The heating didn't work, the windows wouldn't close properly, and the cupboards were full of elaborate handmade shelves. There were doors that led to rooms that led to other rooms that didn't make sense. The house just didn't seem to have a normal layout. But the creepiest room was the laundry. It was a large square room with white tiles with a drain in the middle. Just think of a location inspired by Saw. When you walk into this room, it had three steps down to the floor. On the right was a sink and two doors, one for a shower and the other for the toilet. Straight ahead was the door to the garage, and next to it on the left, the cupboard under the stairs. This cupboard was freezing cold, but it was completely cement and brick. No draft and no gaps, just pitch black darkness. I live with three other people, but our schedules were all mixed, so Tuesdays were my nights alone. I started to notice things like glass would break in the kitchen, but I'd walk in and nothing was broken. I'd walk outside to get the mail and close the door behind me with my dog inside and come back to her on the front step. Then the nightmares. Night after night, I'd have terrifying nightmares of someone knocking on my door and getting up to answer it to no one there, all of which I'd just shake off as an idle mind. Then one night I was home, watching TV, and suddenly I heard a loud rattling. I jumped to my feet and walked to the laundry door where I could hear the rattling on the other side. Possibly someone trying to get through the locked garage door, I thought. I opened the door and the garage door handle was still, but the cupboards one wasn't. 
The entire door was shaking like someone was inside the cupboard, violently trying to get out. I froze, but just for a minute. Grabbed my dog and left the house until someone agreed to come over. I had a friend come over and walk inside. I sat on the stool, well over a meter away from my wall. My friend sat at the table. Maybe you have ghosts, she said. I just want to add that I was raised religious and told there's no such thing for 18 years of my life. In my head, there had to be a logical explanation and my fears were surely irrational. There's no such thing as ghosts, I scoffed. Without another second, pressure on my shoulder pushed me off the stool and slammed me onto the wall in one quick motion. To clarify, I didn't fall off the stool. If I did, I would have hit my head on the wall. My entire body slammed into the wall. I stood and looked at my friend and she looked at me. We said no words and I grabbed my keys and my dog and we got dinner. Nothing was ever spoken about it, how I was thrown across the room. I moved out shortly after, but I will never say ghosts don't exist again. Not even half an hour ago, I just had one of the freakiest paranormal experiences I've had in a while. To give you some backstory, I live in an apartment attached to a funeral home. I'm a mortuary science student and I work for this funeral home to get experience while I'm in school to be a mortician. The funeral home happened to have a vacant apartment set privately in the back that I couldn't possibly turn down. As I moved away from home for this school and I needed an inexpensive place to live. Since the day I moved in, I've been having notable paranormal experiences. For a couple of months, I kept them to myself, not wanting to seem like I was feeding into some spooky funeral home stigma or making it up. But eventually, I was experiencing enough that I had to bring it up to a co-worker of mine and she confirmed that she and a few other employees had seen and heard the same things I have. That being said, it's not news to any of us that the place is haunted, if that's what you want to call it. Today, after I got home from classes and went home, I was feeling extremely uneasy. My apartment felt extra dark, and I felt sort of jumpy. I was standing in my bathroom braiding my hair, and one of my coworkers texted me. She said she has a weird feeling and asked me to go check the front doors of the funeral home to make sure they are locked. I read her text as I braided my hair and her next message pops up. I'm 99% sure I locked it, but I just have a nagging feeling about something. I told her I'd go check. I finished braiding my hair and slipped on my shoes and walked to the door in my apartment that opens into the back of the funeral home. The lights are off and I don't bother turning them on, as the motion sensors in the hallway always kick on by themselves. I made my way to the front lobby, which was dark, not counting the light through the front door windows. I walked to the front doors and pushed. Sure enough, both unlocked. At that moment, I had a really heavy feeling like someone was behind me or watching me. I kept turning around to look, but... Standing by the light at the doors and looking into the dark lobby made it almost impossible to see. I hurried up and locked the doors and made my way back through the lobby. As I was about to enter the hallway, I hear a little girl, giggling. I stopped dead in my tracks for a moment, just at the end of her giggling. It sounded like it was coming from behind a door not six feet away from me. I got chills on my entire body and hightailed it back into the hallway and into my doorway. I locked the door behind me and immediately heard a loud bang from a room in the funeral home. I have no idea what it was, but it was loud, and I'm not about to go check. As I was standing there, actually about to pee my pants, I texted my coworker back saying, the doors were both unlocked. And as I'm typing her my story of what happened, she says, I don't know man, I've been getting weird vibes in there all day. I think maybe it's safe to say the spirits in here are extra active today. It had been a few weeks since I had anything too strange happen, but now I'm extremely on edge. There are two spirits that myself as well as three other co-workers had all seen. One is of a little girl. 
She looks maybe eight years old, she's slightly taller than average, and she shows herself so briefly you wonder if you even saw it. I would almost say she looks ten, but when you hear her giggle, she sounds like a young girl of maybe six years old. The other is a tall, shadow-like man who wears a long black coat and a black hat. He's an entirely different story, though. I'm chilled right now. Some days in here feel weirder than others, and tonight feels like the kind where I probably won't get any sleep. I feel so anxious right now. Usually these things happen in waves, so I feel like I'm just waiting for the next thing to happen. Hey, I'm so thankful for all the feedback I got from this post, and I appreciate all of you taking the time to read. A lot of people have asked that I share more of my experiences here at the funeral home and in my apartment, so I figured I'd add them here and just start from the beginning. Now, the day that I moved in, I was trying to clean and dust everything I unpacked. I was listening to music and polishing one of my end tables when something caught my eye. I glanced towards my hallway where the bathroom is located and briefly saw what looked like a little girl peeking at me from behind the door frame. I did a double take and she was gone. I paused my music and kind of stood there with a stupid look on my face, I'm guessing. I heard a soft rustling noise from the bathroom like the sound of maybe the shower curtain. I walked over to the bathroom and peeked in, but of course there was nothing there. My first few nights there were pretty normal. Some strange noises like bumps on the wall, knocking, brushing noises, but I attributed it all to the fact that I was in a new place and those noises were probably normal in the building. One night I was taking a shower minding my own business when I felt an ice cold air on my back. I didn't have the air on at this time and there are no windows in my bathroom that could cause a draft. I felt immediately uneasy and peeked out behind my shower curtain to see that everything was normal. I went back to showering and tried to pretend nothing happened. As I was facing the water, my towel that was draped up over the curtain rod fell to the floor. I jumped and whipped around and quickly peeked behind the curtain again. Nothing. I was pretty shaken now and I picked up my towel and draped it back over the rod. I tried to hurry up and finish my shower. Just as I was about to turn off the water, I hear my bathroom door click. In absolute fear and panic and ready to nakedly fight someone, I ripped open the curtain to see my door slowly opening. I stood there and watched until it slowly reached the doorstop. I said something along the lines of, Oh my god through tears and fumbled for my towel and ran out of my bathroom. I got dressed and left for the rest of the day and didn't come back until about 9 that night. Nothing happened the rest of that evening. After that, things were pretty quiet for a little while. Around two weeks later, it was a little after midnight and I was doing laundry. My washer and dryer are in the actual prep room, where we embalm people, so to do laundry I'd have to go into the back hallway of the funeral home. I had just put in a load of wash and was walking back to my apartment door at the very end of the hallway. I heard a door latch, kind of like the door was closed in the frame, but not latched if that makes sense. It made me jump, and I turned around and at the end of the hallway, I saw the tall shadow man. Now the owner of the funeral home was a big man who wears a long black coat in the winter and has this black cowboy hat sort of thing he wears. So for a split second I thought maybe it was my boss who had been coming in for something, but it wasn't. It felt like a good two or three seconds that I watched him cross the end of the hallway and he just disappeared into thin air almost as I was focusing on him. I mentioned in my original story that there were motion sensor lights in the hallway and these lights were all on during this encounter. He was tall and big. He had a hat on similar to the one my boss wears and was black from top to bottom, like a really opaque shadow. Needless to say, I once again almost peed myself. I bolted back into my apartment and locked the door. I was so scared and in so much disbelief that I actually became lightheaded and had to sit down. I still didn't mention him or the little girl I saw to anyone I work with. One day when I came home from class I noticed my microwave time had changed to military time. 
I didn't think anything of it and I messed with the settings, switching it back. The next night I was working, cleaning one of the lounges and I noticed that the time on the microwave in there was on military time too. At that point I honestly figured maybe there was a power outage that day and when the microwaves kicked back on they just went wonky and switched to military time. This was until the next day which was my day off. I slept in and lounged in bed for like an hour and one of my best friends called me. We had been talking for about 20 minutes and I was like alright I should probably get up and do something. I glanced to see what time it is and my alarm clock was on military time. My alarm clock is a cheap battery operated alarm that doesn't even plug into a wall. I've had it for about 4 years and had never seen it switch to military time. I went silent on the phone and stared at the clock trying to find some sort of logical explanation. The microwaves kind of made sense at first, but then, with my alarm clock, I couldn't shake the feeling that it meant something. Not long after that is when things got considerably spookier. Probably about three days later I was coming back home one afternoon from classes. I came right in and threw my keys and my purse on the kitchen table and then turned my back to the table to plug the sink and start running water to do my dishes. My dishes had been piling up. Swore to myself I'd do them first thing when I got home. I was letting the sink fill and turned to get my keys and purse from the kitchen table and put them on the end table by my door, which is where I always place them so I don't forget them when I'm running out the door on a 3am death call. My purse was there, but my keys were not. I had just come in and threw them on the table. It took a few seconds to get the sink ready, so... They didn't get up and walk away in the short amount of time. Bewildered, I started looking under the table, on the floor, patting my pockets trying to find my keys. I had just put them there. Frustrated, I got to plop down on my couch and ponder if I'm going crazy. I have a heavy quilt on my couch, I like my place chilly, and when I went to lift it and sit down, there were my keys. I didn't go anywhere near my couch when I came in. I'm 100% positive I put my keys on the table next to my purse when I came in, and there was no reason they'd be under the quilt. But that wasn't the weirdest part. On my key ring, I have my parents' house key and my car key on the main key rings, and a second key ring is attached to that one with the apartment door keys on it. The key ring with the apartment keys on it was stretched and bent as if though someone had tried to rip the keys straight off the other one. The key rings aren't flimsy, bendy ones either. I could hardly open them enough to lock the key rings together when I put them on. It would have taken serious force to completely pull open the key ring like that. I actually do have a picture of my keys somewhere on my laptop that I will locate and attach later so you guys can see what I mean. My stomach dropped through my bottom when I saw my keys. They were all messed up under the blanket. I almost didn't even believe if I was seeing it all correctly, and I felt a little crazy. At this point, I was feeling like I should at least vent to someone about what was going on. A night or two after that, I was working a visitation with an older woman who had worked for my boss for a long time. She's my favorite co-worker as she's easy to talk to and reminds me of my grandma or something. Anyways, she asked me how it was getting settled into the apartment and if I was enjoying it. I told her how much I love my apartment, but that there were some weird things that don't make sense. She asked what I meant and I honestly didn't even want to say it because I didn't want her to think I was crazy or messing with her. After my hesitation, I just asked if she thought the funeral home was haunted. She explained to me that she had had some strange experiences here as well as a couple of others I work with. They've all heard loud screaming and moaning from time to time in the prep room. They've heard giggling, unexplained doors opening and slamming. What upset me the most was that she had told me about a tall black man with a hat he had seen in the back hallway a couple of times. At that point, I word vomited and told her everything that had happened since I moved in. That was the night that I felt like it was confirmed to me that there was something or things here. I sort of wanted to vomit, I was so scared, but at least I knew that I wasn't crazy. For a few weeks after that, nothing huge happened. 
I would always hear strange noises at night. It's not uncommon to hear a door open and close by itself somewhere in the funeral home. I have also heard people talking, hear cots sliding around on the floor and the same moans and screams my coworkers have all heard. This has become almost normal to me, so although it's freaky, it wasn't bothering me directly and I could live with that. At least for a little while. Once again, things picked back up one day when I was in my bedroom putting clothes away. I was sitting on my floor folding a mountain of laundry when I heard a loud, clear as day sound of a man clear his throat in my living room. The kind of <clears throat> that you do to get someone's attention. It was so clear and real I didn't even think ghost. I was confused for a moment thinking maybe my boss had come in to speak to me, but surely he'd knock. Nobody ever would just walk in here. I hopped up and stepped into my living room. Nobody there. I peered around the corner to see if anyone was in my bathroom. No one. The realization that I was alone set in and my stomach sort of dropped. But honestly, I was so used to so much activity that after a few minutes of pacing around in disbelief, I shook it off and went back to folding laundry. In the most recent weeks... The most I've experienced are the normal sounds and voices and bumps in the night I always hear. One night, a couple of random lights and my TV all shut off at once unexpectedly, and I had to go into the funeral home utility room to flip the switches in the breaker box. I noticed that when I have someone over and start telling them about the spirits, the lights or TV will shut off. A friend of mine has experienced this with me on three different occasions. That pretty much catches me up to the original story I posted here. It's been an absolute ride being here. Some nights it's nothing and some nights I sleep with the blankets over my head. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to read this. It actually feels sort of therapeutic to share with you all and I never guessed so many people would be interested in my story. Thanks everyone for being so cool and giving so much kind feedback. This happened when I was growing up. I lived on a piece of property next to a state park in a house my step-grandfather had built. Prior to that, the land was undeveloped. I used to see things sometimes, but my mother would usually tell me it was my imagination and that I just needed to stop being such a wuss. Sometimes I wondered if I was really crazy. It didn't help the household was dysfunctional and stressful and mom gaslighted me a lot mostly to tell me I wasn't actually being abused. Just trying to give a bit of background info. Anyway, one bright morning I saw someone poking around in our mailbox. It was an elderly lady in a pink housecoat. I couldn't figure out why she was there, so I called out to her. She turned to look at me, glared, and disappeared. And by disappeared, I mean she just stopped being there. I was very weirded out. But I knew better than to say anything and after going down and looking at the mailbox, which was no longer open, I decided to try to forget about the whole thing. However, a couple of days later I saw her again. And the moment I made a noise she turned, glared, and vanished. She seemed really annoyed at me but I didn't really feel a sense of menace. She was more like the neighbor, a uh, few houses down who disliked me because I was a child and therefore clearly about to break something or be loud or whatever. Unpleasant, but not dangerous. It kept happening. Often, not every day, but quite frequently, through the end of winter, through spring, and into early summer, if I didn't make any noise but just watched her, she would fade away after a couple of minutes. Not a Hollywood ghost fade, she was never translucent, but she would become less defined, start to look sort of smudgy, like a poorly printed picture, and then just not be there anymore. By late spring, I was feeling certain that she wasn't all in my head, so one day when I saw her, I slipped back into the house, got my mother, and asked her to come outside and look at the mailbox, but not to make any noise. I think she assumed I wanted her to see some interesting wildlife. I was in luck. The lady was still there. And my mother looked at the mailbox, looked startled and called out, 
Excuse me. As usual, Housecoat Lady turned, glared, and disappeared. Mom looked surprised and alarmed. I said, I told you not to make any noise. She gets mad and disappears if you do. Mom looked at me, looked at the mailbox, looked at me. She looked scared and confused. But you saw her, right? I said. And she was wearing a pink housecoat. I, I, I don't have time for this. And my mom turned around and walked back into the house and ignored me completely when I tried to bring it up later. I didn't want to make her mad. Bad things happen when she got mad. So I dropped the subject. But I was super pleased because if someone else saw it too, then I wasn't hallucinating or tricking myself. The rest of the story is pretty anticlimactic. I kept seeing the old lady off and on, late morning to mid-afternoon regardless of weather. I saw her a couple of times that fall, but after that, never again. My aunt still lives in that house. No one who looked like pink housecoat lady has ever lived there, and nobody had died on the premises. My aunt has since taken down the mailbox. I think she has a P.O. box now because she travels a lot. The only reason I'm sharing this now is because two days ago, my mom called me to tell me her gift had arrived, and on a wild impulse, I brought it up. Mom and I, well, we aren't close, but we're on speaking terms and normally I will not discuss anything relating to my childhood with her, too much baggage. But I casually said, hey, do you remember that old lady by the mailbox? The one in the pink housecoat who wasn't actually there? And when I showed her to you, you you wouldn't discuss it? Mom didn't miss a beat. She replied, well, to be fair... The whole thing was pretty disconcerting. I was shocked. Usually mom denies anything that even remotely paints her in a bad light, for starters. But I was also exhilarated because it was proof. At least as much proof as anyone can get under circumstances like these. So when I was in junior high, a girl was assaulted and killed behind the alley on 75th and Glendale. Her name was Amy and our family and parents did everything in their power to not let us kids know what happened. Well, I had been seeing ghosts and having premonitions since I was a child, so when we moved in, I saw Amy in my bedroom the first day and I said hello. I had no idea she was dead and thought I was just talking to one of the neighbors who decided to visit. My bedroom was facing the back alleyway and there was a large wall surrounding the small complex, a duplex in a wide U-shape that was blocked in. It wasn't until my sister came in and asked who I was talking to that I introduced Amy and my sister told me to stop being stupid. It was then I realized I was talking to a ghost. No one would believe me and once my mother even caught her while I was at band camp sitting in my room. She screamed and refused to go in there again. Well, during a party, my sister had told my cousins and family about Amy. A good deal of the adults were aware I was different. Some aunts and uncles told me I was born the Oho, the Eye, and I could see and know things. My sister and cousins came into my room while I was watching TV and began teasing me, in which prompted my cousin to say, Prove it. There was no way out of my room other than the door and window, so I said find and turned off the TV and focused everyone to my closet door. Both doors slid from side to side, revealing the closet, and to the left was the bedroom door. I simply said, Amy, my cousin wants to meet you. At first nothing happened, then fingers slipped out from the crack, and the door began to open slowly. As it did, Amy's hair and pale paler came into view. It's important to know that the closet faces the window and I had it open with full view of my family outside, everyone enjoying the party. The girls began screaming and screaming, prompting adults to notice and cause my mother to burst in who was in the bathroom near the bedroom. She came in yelling and saw the closet door slam close. She pulled it open 
yelling for us to stop playing and was shocked to find it empty. My cousins and sisters all ran out. My mother turned to me and told me to stop with my bruja stuff and told me to tell Amy to stop scaring people. She turned and closed the door leaving me in the dark, to which I turned the TV back and started watching my show again. That same night I was outside with everyone and my uncle was by my bedroom window talking to who he thought was me. He was pretty drunk and it wasn't until I came over and asked who he was talking to that he stopped and realized I wasn't in my bedroom. He told me he thought it was me and said, it must have been the ghost. My family has always believed in the supernatural and the other side and since I tend to know things, trust me when asking me certain things. After I moved out, I said a prayer for Amy in hopes she would move on. She was my only friend and I was hers. We would sit together and I would hand her a book to read and she would watch TV with me. I still have feelings and sense things. It's gotten dimmer but since I started meditating and practicing my craft, my psychic abilities have grown. Newfoundland is an alien hotspot if the stories I hear are any indication. Almost everyone I know has some sort of story about when they lost huge chunks of time and were missing, usually for about a day, but it can go as high as a week. I've never heard any violent encounters, but a lot of I was frozen and couldn't move for a bit due to a light from the sky ones. It's a pretty good assumption that if aliens do exist, they stalk my family. My dad has stories about being frozen on beaches, being watched in his sleep, and a weird story about the stars changing configurations. My mom has stories about meeting aliens, and she has a few accounts of what they look like. I might tell these stories one day, but I really feel like this is a good introduction to the types of encounters my family has had. It all started when I was about 13. There's nothing overly remarkable about me other than being in a military family and I was more precocious than most. At the time I was living in my dad's hometown, maybe a solid kilometer up a hill. My house was a raised bungalow, meaning that all the first floor windows were about 10 feet off the ground. My window faced the front yard and was probably the only one that didn't have some kind of bush in front of it. Basically, I had a good solid view of my outside. One night I remember being woken up fairly abruptly around 1 in the morning. Not unusual for a 13 year old so I thought go get a drink, probably pee and go back to bed. Except when I tried to move I couldn't. Some people describe the feeling of an overbearing weight that prevents them from moving. This wasn't that. It was like my whole body was asleep. Complete with a tingling feeling and an utter lack of ability to move. I wasn't sleeping in a weird position aside from maybe an extra blanket on the bed I couldn't figure out a reason why this was happening. The only thing I could move was my head as my neck felt asleep but not enough to completely prevent movement like the rest of my body. So I flopped my head to one side and that's when I saw it. In my window, roughly in the middle, was a disc shaped object. It hovered maybe a foot away from the glass and didn't move. This is remarkable for anyone that's been to Newfoundland, where 40 kilometers per hour winds are the norm basically every day. The disc was maybe three feet in diameter and the better part of a foot tall. It let out this low grade almost LED like hue, reminds me of those horrible blue Christmas lights. The thing had three thick prominent ridges on what I assumed to be the front of it which was facing me. From the middle one came a red light and the thing didn't have a lens. It kind of just emanated from this thing. It split into a wide vertical pattern and was scanning my body. When I moved my head the disc was beaming around my belly button area. As soon as my head flopped with maybe a second or so delay it moved the scanning laser to my eyes. For maybe five seconds I stared rather uncomfortably into this horrible red light and it burned. I wanted to close my eyes desperately as it felt not dissimilar to staring into the sun, but they wouldn't move. I tried to yell, 
as I recall, but I couldn't say anything. And much like staring into the sun, you see little else. After the five or so seconds, the light turned off and I could just make out that the disc object flew off down the road towards the ocean. I was awake for maybe ten or more seconds before I fell asleep. For full context, this all happened in about 20 seconds, give or take. I need to point out this happened in 2003 in rural Newfoundland. At that time, there were no such things as drones. Drones were the terrifying flying machines the US was sending to bomb Middle Eastern countries. I had only even recently seen them on TV as those big white plane looking things. I have no real explanation for this other than possibly extraterrestrials. I had tried to talk to my family and classmates about it, but they mostly called me a loony and laughed. Eventually that night passed for me trying to tell people about it. No one will believe me, so why bother? A month, maybe two passes, and my life carries on as normal. The only real difference is I become terrible at math. I was a top student in my class, always pulling the best grades for most of my school life until that point, given the math isn't all that hard, but I really started to suck. My grades went from 90s to 60s, often 50s, and sometimes even failing in math I was able to do not even four months ago. No one was concerned for some reason, but that was a frequent theme in my teen years, so I was now just the kid that had fallen from grace. Still had amazing grades and everything else, just never again in math. So one night I remember being woken up. Again, my body felt like it was asleep and again I had some control over my neck. But I remember this like I remember a dream. But way too many details for it to be normal. But I'll get to that. The first thing that hits me is the blinding white light. It was coming from outside my window, brighter than stadium lights, and coming from who knows where, but I knew it was close to my house. All I heard was a low, growling hum coming from outside. In my room, where two of those discs I had seen before, shining a wide red light all over the room, which dampened the sheer brightness of the light outside enough that I could see. Then I see one of them. It walks into my room, and I remember being scared-ish, but largely indifferent. It was easily over 12 feet tall and was uncomfortably skinny. Its arms and legs were way too long for the tiny torso it had, about the size of maybe a child. They were multi-jointed in at least seven places that allowed it to fold up its arms and legs enough that it could fit into the room. I have no doubt that if it were to fully extend all of its joints, the thing could have easily topped 20 feet. It had hands which had too many joints in the fingers, way too many fingers and no thumbs. They were in half circle around its pretty round palm and generally unsettling now that I think about it. It had a head, a huge head, but it lacked any real eyes except for maybe tiny pinpoints where a massive socket would otherwise be. It had no nose, no hair, no real chin and two holes where our cheeks would be. I'm guessing that might be a mouth, but who knows. The head was thin, because of course it was thin and resembled somewhat an oblong pancake. The whole thing had white skin with a grey undertone or what I assumed to be such given the lighting in the room. The creature held out its hand and instinctively I held it. It walked me out of my room, stark naked, and was leading me to my living room. When I get into my hall, I see all the doors in my house are open and there are a dozen of these things sort of mulling about. I remember one looking in our linen closet, one walking into our basement and another unscrewing a light bulb. All over the house were the discs that gave everything that faint red tint and the huge stadium lights from outside making it look like broad daylight but with a slight red tint to it as well. And the dining room was my mother, also stark naked, kind of just standing there as two of the creatures were in the kitchen doing something. Lying on the couch in my living room was my dad, again naked, with three of the creatures looming over him with a bunch of weird tools in their hands, and I can assume doing some kind of procedure. I remember asking, where's my sister? To which I got the reply outside from the creature holding my hand. 
I am still unsure if I heard this from inside my head or if the creature said something out of its uncomfortable holes, but I accepted this as good enough of an answer. As I walked by my dad, I could see the creatures were fiddling with my dad's junk, poking and prodding it. I remember being concerned as I knew my dad had just had his vasectomy, but I again just got the feeling that it would be fine. The creature I was with placed me in the corner of the room, facing the wall, and I sat down cross-legged without much issue. The creature then left, and I was there for about a minute or so. All I can remember from that time is a few details. Above me was one of the discs shining in broad red light, and I had the faint blue as well giving my vision an odd hue. The only other distinguishing feature I remember is the silence the piercing and utter silence only broken by my soft, low, growling hum coming from outside. I remember then waking up, back in my bed, no worse for wear. All I think is, dang, that was a realistic dream, and went about my day. The only difference is I had, and still have, a small lump on the back of my neck the size of a split pea. It comes and goes... Sometimes I feel it and sometimes I don't and a few times I have squeezed it and some dry powdery substance came out. I just assumed it was weird pus but if it ever happens again I might try to get it looked at. A few years go by and me and my dad were chatting and we got on the topic of aliens, one of his personal favorites. I tell my dad about the multi-jointed creature thing and before I can get to the point where I reach the living room, he says, I had a dream like that. A bunch of skinny white men with hoods were cutting my junk, red hue over everything. I remember seeing them sit you in the corner and just sort of stay there for a bit. <laughs> Crazy dreams, eh? I asked if it seemed real to him and he said, well, Yeah, I had those kind of dreams since I was a kid. The white guys in hoods never do anything interesting. This was the only time. Our brains are weird, aren't they? I've brought it up a few times since then, but I don't get a whole lot more than what is above. My sister is somewhat of a similar story, but she remembers only about three seconds of it, and I have maybe two minutes. The best guess I have is aliens, and this is far from the only time I encountered these creatures but I'll save that story for another day. So I grew up next to a, let's just say, a very creepy 300 to 400 acre forested area in the middle of Tennessee, United States, for some location context. Apparently used to belong to a family of freed slaves way, way back when which is now still owned and undeveloped except for some really old dilapidated and decomposing structures sporadically scattered across it from when it was occupied by the original family. My brother and I used to go hiking into the woods and found these places, but we stopped because, well, that part comes later. For some clarity, I mean an old farmhouse, smokehouse, and on the border of the property line in the wooded area behind my old house was a rickety old house. Think little house in the prairie or old Amish style, and you got the picture if you age it about 150 plus years. So my old house, which was on kind of an elevation with the backyard slopping to the wooded property line bordering said creepy 300 acre wood, the neighborhood I was in was basically bordering the forests along this property. With the backyards bordering the forest line that was demarcated by a solid line of underbrush and very mature trees. Now my first memory of this property, and this still creeps me out, so mind you there are no roads, no inhabited houses, nothing built or done to this area because of a land division dispute and some will and deed problems with the family who owns the land and apparently has been that way for 150 plus years. Just forest. My sister and I were out playing in our backyard near the property line, where the creepy falling down little prairie looking house was when she spotted an old woman in the old dilapidated house behind the edge of the property. 
The front of the house was broken down, and you could see clearly into it, and had two stories. Kind of like a cutaway from a dollhouse, where you can take off the front and see all the rooms. So this 70 to 80 year old woman was just sitting on the green lawn chair, watching us from the second story loft. We were young, maybe 7 to 8 years old, so we didn't really notice some of the more peculiar aspects of this scene. We'd been playing for a few hours and would have seen someone walk by carrying a green lawn chair because we had a clear view of the old house and you couldn't really get to it unless either you came from our yard or hiked through a ton of woods. An elderly woman dragged a lawn chair up a rotted out ladder to the second story out of a rotted out loft and was just chilling, watching me and my sister. So of course my sister goes and says hi finds out she speaks and said she used to live in that house a long time ago. She looked fairly normal for an old person, but the face was indistinct to me, like I couldn't really get a solid look at it for some reason. I got uncomfortable and said bye to the creepy old lady and left when I basically grabbed my sister and we went back to the house. Now this bothers me because no one has ever lived or been doing anything in this area of forest for over 150 years. No one could have, or should have been living there. No records of it or anything. Also, I know for a fact that there are no roads or trails or anything going to that old house. Even now, thanks to Google Earth. So how did this old woman just appear and disappear? Because we were walking back to the house. I glanced back at the property line about 80 yards back to the old house, and the green chair was there. But no lady. Didn't pass us by didn't hear her climb down. Nothing. Clear line of sight, early afternoon, no overcast and well lit. Just gone. Did some research from when I had to sell stuff door to door for school. Couldn't find a similar person on my street or the next or even in the neighborhood. So yeah, this day, I had no clue what happened there. Now my second memory, or the red eyes as I like to call this story, this happened maybe a few times to me in middle school, but sometimes when I was walking home from the bus stop at the end of the street. The tree line and underbrush along the backyards of the houses that bordered the creepy forest started to have glowing red dots and sporadic clusters, and resembled to me eyes like tiny orbs of red dull light that appeared along the underbrush and followed me home. I thought it was maybe berries, but no, I hiked through that area with my brothers, no berries or red anything ever, not holy or seasonal fruiting bushes or animals, because we had some squirrels, foxes, and deer. But that's about it. I couldn't explain it then, and I still can't explain it now. I just remember running home whenever I saw the lights in the underbrush along the tree line appear, and hide in my house as fast as I could. The one time I was brave enough to go up to the bushes, the light disappeared before I even got close. No sound, no wind, nothing but kind of a cold chill, which at the time was weird because it was a Tennessee late spring or early autumn when this happened to me, and it stays pretty dang warm usually. I could never find any evidence as to what it was, no red berries or critters or some wackadoo waving around red Christmas lights, and this memory still gets me. Memory number three. Why do I feel like I'm being watched? So my old house was well old, 30 years or so. Never really got the cold spots or other classic signs someone is making stuff up about having a paranormal encounter. But every now and then, when I was alone in my old house, maybe the basement usually or occasionally outside in the woods, I got the sensation something or someone else was there. And every time before I felt that sensation, I started to get afraid a little at first then full-on mad dash away in full adrenaline mode whenever I realized what I was feeling. This happened more than I liked. I hated it and thought I was losing my mind. Mind you, I didn't do any drugs, prescribed or otherwise, or even start drinking till college. I couldn't explain it, and it didn't fit panic attack symptoms or anything similar. I'd been checked out and looked at my medical records and couldn't find anything to explain it from my biological perspective. 
Well, I got a few more jarring memories, but these are the ones I'll share for now because it's getting pretty long. If I get any interest, I may post the rest, and you might just find out what else eventually happened. I lived in a house from when I was 3 to 10 where things happened that I just can't explain, although I was a child, so my memory could be foggy or filled with fantasy. Some background info, my mom was working weekend shifts in Norway, since they have better payments and less taxes, so she would go like 5 to 7 days at a time, or Danish. So that night it was just me, my sister, and my dad. My sister would sleepwalk very much as a child, so it was not an uncommon occurrence to find her in all kinds of crazy places. One time she slept under the couch. Many times she would just be standing in corners in weird places. Nothing paranormal about it, just a sleeping child with marathon legs, as my mother used to say. I was a little coward when I was a child and I was very afraid of the dark, but I wouldn't wake up and cry if I had nightmares. I would most likely scream, but my sister would cry, very silently, whenever she awoke on one of her sleepwalkings. Now my father is a manly man, and my friends used to be scared of him, and they called him the Warlord. Now he is a conservative in the sense that he doesn't believe in anything he cannot see with his own two eyes. My mom is very much a believer, and even believes she can speak to spirits and stuff, and I believe there is more between the heaven and earth, but... I am very much a skeptic even though I've had experiences. Again, I was a child, so my point of reference and testimony is not the best since I'm 100% sure I saw a little house gnome one time before sleeping. Normally it was always me, my sister, and our mom that spoke of weird things that had happened, but a few years after we moved, my dad told us his story. So we woke up one night and could hear someone crying. Naturally, when hearing this, he went looking for her as he thought my sister probably sleepwalked somewhere and got scared when she awoke. This happened in periods almost every night. And as he went down from the first floor, he realized it came from the basement. The only way down to this basement was down a really steep staircase, and keep in mind this was the middle of the night. Believing my sister somehow managed to get down there, he of course went looking for her. Again, they have found her in weird places, so this wouldn't be unbelievable. He says that the crying stopped the moment he came down there, and he felt like he was being watched. And there was this black figure over near the wall, close to one of the doors for the rooms. He said as he tried to get closer, he felt uneasy. And then the door close to where he saw the black figure slammed open, and he says he heard a scream unlike any he had ever heard before. I actually remember being awoken that night and him taking us to a hostel but never saying why. I was a child but remember this very clearly. When he tells this story he will always end it with, and that was the only time I ever ran from something in pure terror. Turns out that my sister was sleeping in my room but in his sleepy days my dad forgot. Her sleeping in my room actually became my parents' secret weapon against the sleepwalks since I would wake up every time she started to sleepwalk because I was a very light sleeper and I would call for my parents. I have no idea about what happened in that basement but I have never seen him as scared as that night and even though this is almost 18 to 20 years ago, he would still look upset when telling it, like it shook him to the core. After she had surgery for some kidney stones, she became more sensitive about things. Exactly after the surgery, while she was still in the hospital, we both met in our dreams. She's seen me in her dream and I've seen her in my similar dreams in the same night. There's a lot to say about that too, so I'll keep it short here. About half a year later, she kept mentioning about little ugly people coming out of this particular flower pot in her apartment. According to her, they would come out during nighttime or very early in the morning, just rising from the flower pot, walking a bit around the room and then going back to the flower pot and decreasing in size until the flower pot would swallow them. 
Bear in mind, this happened around 10 years ago. She told the entire family, and even though me and my mom are believers of the paranormal, we thought it might be the age that's speaking in this case. Maybe she was hallucinating. Maybe it was sleep paralysis. But no, she kept insisting and insisting that she sees them every night. Then she kept giving us details. We kept suggesting that she might be dreaming. She would respond that she would get up and turn on the lights every time. They seemed to wake her up almost every night. And some nights she would go to my grandpa in his bedroom. They were sleeping separately because they enjoyed the solitude and comfort. And she would wake him up and say, They're back. By the time grandpa would come into her room, nothing was there. One night she called me and my mom to say that they've woken her up again. These are the details that she gave. They were small but quite ugly. She even named them the Little Ugly People, maximum one meter in height. They were weirdly dressed. Later on, after she described them better, I came to the conclusion that the fashion style would be around the 1800s. They also had hats. They were both male and female, and it was only one of them coming out per night, never more of them, even though I do refer to them as plural. It seemed that they were struggling a bit to come out of the flower pot. She tried to communicate with them every time, but with no success. They never hurt her. They weren't doing anything to the objects in the room. They walked around the room, sometimes going to a different flower pot and disappearing there. There were times when she lost it and started screaming at them and telling them to leave and to leave her alone. One time she said she woke up, looked around, and there was this tiny creature staring at her. Most of the time they were all staring at her. Some of them had beards. We've searched long and far for any kind of reasonable explanation at the time. Then we started believing her and we searched for a paranormal one. I posted on the paranormal forum many, many years ago and the answer that I received was that there were gnomes visiting and that my grandma should interact with them as they might get aggressive and dangerous. They suggested to put rocks in a circle around the flower pot and we did. I don't recall any other suggestion but... I will ask my mum and I will it at the post if necessary. This went on and on for more than a year. After about six months of quiet, after we put the stones, it must have worked I suppose, she started to forget things. Soon after she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which she battled bravely for another two to three years. She is no longer with us and I miss her, and sometimes I do dream about her. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in a long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to always spank your gnomes. Going to Taco Bell is... It certainly doesn't taste bad to me, even though I enjoy eating it, but you just kind of, you know, the meme of, of it being diarrhea town is, it definitely has truth to it. <laughs>